الحلا في مولد النغم Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Finding Me on the ITV networks. Today a very special day, a historic moment and I think a historic interview because I have somebody very special with me and that is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria on the same platform with a Fallers in a Walk for Access student and of course with Pastor Emmanuel from the Elam Full Gospel Church we spoke to previously talking about Walk for Access and the issues at the University of Pretoria but it's historic because the vice chancellor has agreed to give us his time and as you know we've had many discussions on this particular platform speaking about the inaccessibility of management high management especially at the different universities across south africa so with that i'd like to say thank you very much to all of you for being here marcus machinini who is a student and follows and a walk for access uh, individual Um, you're still at the University of Pretoria, Marcus, and you're still studying there, right? So it must be awesome sitting next to the Vice Chancellor and this Professor Tawan Akupe. Welcome and thank you very much for making this time. I'm really humbled by the fact that you agreed to do this interview with us, Professor. Thank you. Thank and, you. And Pastor Emmanuel, we've had you before. Welcome again, Pastor. We're going to talk about the challenges that you had and, of course, the wonderful moments I know. that all materialized during walk for access but first i'd like to come straight to you um prof kope if you don't mind and that is i want to touch on the fundamental question the conceptualization of the university if we can understand the conceptualization of the university then of course and how you view it then obviously in that way you will develop ideas solutions policy proposals to meet that particular conceptualization so one of the challenges that the folders brought out and even walk for access raised was the understanding of the university as a public good and not as a form of commodification how do you see the university so our universities especially in south africa and, and africa in general exist for 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 a very core purpose which are put this way is to transform lives as the lives of individuals but also to transform communities and to transform sectors in our societies transform society itself and to transform the continent and to contribute to the world that is the public good so as you can see from my formulation I'm not just looking at the individual the individual exists in society especially where we come from on the african continent no person is an island an individual's life is changed but then they have to change the lives of other individuals and remember that on the continent we have many challenges we do not have as many people who are educated in different fields as we need to develop this into a prosperous just and thriving uh, society then we have challenges obviously in 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 funding all of these things in the policies that our governments choose in each sector particularly my interest is education being a vice chancellor but i just generally my my religion is education if you like mm -hmm. over and above religious faith and second health because the two are interconnected and the two are big challenges on our continent if we solve health education and health on our continent the rest is very possible that is economic development but inclusive economic development not a society of inequalities as we see growing on the continent so if the university is a public good professor kope and then i'm going to bring this question to marcus because the, the hashtag specifically was walk for access access was not only about financial access but about physical access but prior to you taking up the position the university of pretoria um participated or, or moved ahead with a very I would say colonial kind of a structure and that was securitization of the entire university fingerprints preventing access to students students struggle to come in long queues during examination time where you have to stand outside the gate you know like keep the hordes outside let the few in and those that are in let's you know um manage them that's that's the 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 image that has been given a public good should not be that there should be free access anybody should walk in if you speak about from individual to community to society to continent to the world at last then all of them should have access and feel comfortable in coming in to engage with the university forum but the university is securitized how yeah. are you going to so 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 as you can add something as the university also is a public intellectual space yes. it's something like a public podcast at the SABC which I should add into the mix and it suffers the same problems of accessibility and because of its funding so i've said and i said this in my second week to the senate of the university i've said it to the various faculties i've visited is that university must because of 
it's a public good and it's public intellectual space where there must be movement in either way. We should do public seminars where people can easily come. We, it, therefore, we must, we must strike the following uh, 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 balance, which must fall on the public good side. We know there is one problem we, we face in South Africa, is that the state authorities have not ensured that crime does not invade our universities. So as I sit right now here, I fear every day for my students when they leave class, even in a securitized environment, to go to their hostels where they are mugged, attacked, and even some of them are raped. So what should we do at the university? Strike the following balance between securing the safety of persons, property of the universities, libraries, cars, everything, and personal safety with public openness. And also so that the two are not mutually exclusive. You can, in fact, with technologies today, you can ensure actually that you have non-intrusive technologies that don't violate anybody's privacy, but ensure that people who want to harm people in the university or its property are prevented by appropriate constitutional and legal means, but otherwise there's free access. And I then say it in that context, Prospect Gate is going to be opened, but it won't just be opened, just open the gates. It will be made into a fully accessible, even in the physical sense. The old Prospect Gate, people had to queue heavily because it was not properly constructed. We're going to reconstruct it so that there is ease of access in every sense of the way. But also to respect the symbolic idea that Prospect Gate was associated with a struggle for access to education, which is not prevented by financial means. Wonderful. Thank you, Marcus. So part of that has been your struggle as well. Yes, I think just like the professor is saying, the, the Prospect Gate in itself is very symbolic in, in the struggle of free education and access, especially to the University of Pretoria, because that's where most students gathered and that's where we, we sort of built on this thing of, of uh, the fullest movement at the University of Pretoria. But the university has a bigger problem. And I think that is the acceptance and maybe not acceptance, but the political space, it's, it's, it's very, it, it's shut down, basically. You know, being in the university before Fizz Must Fall, um, the university was really open. You know, the, the security was not as much and it was easy to, to move around. And um, I think now when the, when the fallist movement started and the whole thing started, it, it became very sec securitized and there was a lot of security, even, even uh, private security. But now the problem is that students, even after the, the FISMAS4 movement and all those movements, the institution is still the same. You know, they, they've applied the, the divide and conquer um, principles to say we're going to divide the, the students. And when you see it now, students were not only divided amongst political lines, but also in class. You can see that there are students who are rich who sit that side and then there's those poor students in, in that area kind of thing. There's engineering side, then there's the student center side. You know, when you go to the student center, you find shops like Piazza. Psychologically, it, it tells you, oh, this is just for poor students where you can just buy snacks and whatnot. You go to the engineering side, you find Ceres restaurants, your um, Tribeca and all of those things. Psychologically, those are things that you analyze as a student who's, who's been in the university. So, so these geographies of violence have been reinstated in the university yeah. through the way in which the institution manages the bodies of the students. I mean, I was recently at a diversity meeting and one of the students, we were talking about, you know, just expressing student activism. And one student said, he said, ma'am, even if, you know, the, the, the psyche of the university is such post freeze must fall, that if a few black students just get together and even want to sing, before you know it, there's a whole lot of bouncers around them, watching them, checking on them, and preventing them even just from being joyful, you know? So what about organizing? But can I give some bit of perspective? Is yes. the one of the causes, and I, was, uh, I wasn't at UP, so I can't speak for UP, I was at WITS. So I knew almost all of the four lists by name and number, they knew me by name and number, and I mean even the cell phone number, is that when the fees must fall happened, it was not an event. It was a culmination of number of things that happened pre-94 and post-94. So the divisions I saw in the universities that I worked in, Rhodes and, and Vits, even as early as 99, was that a class division was beginning to start. The students were politically conscious, the students who were not. And that happened all the way until fees must fall. So we must understand it was not a moment. In fact, the fees must fall moment was a reaction to this growing class division and the fact that NEFSAS was no longer adequate as presently structured then. 
And also these things, um, I agree with the police co colleagues, that it has created a number of divisions all over the place and not created a unitary university where you differ on ideas and intellectual debate. That also has to be asked is, what was the vision post-94 of the democratic government, of the university system? I think they put a lot of energy into lots of policies. They put a lot of energy into merging universities. But some things were left unanswered. One, how to fund the students sustainably into the future and to realize students who didn't come from originally rich backgrounds were now in universities like UP, VITS and UCT. So 2015, 2016 was an explosion of that particular moment. And one could say it was timely that the issue become an issue of public debate. It's not been solved even now, by the way. Only some people got the 350,000. 350 is too low. Missing midly, really, strictly speaking, goes all the way up to 700,000. So we still actually sit with a partially solved issue. But also, there was no staff development program to assist transformation in the former white universities and to assist transformation in formerly historical colleges. Because there is a danger here. We always speak about well, the, white. the former white universities. We forget our fortes, our tough lobs, and so on. Yeah. South Africa is a diverse country. It should be that any student should actually choose by, say, the best program I want is at Fort Hay. It's not at Vitz. I'm a rich student from Centre, but I'm going to Fort Hay because I'm going to get the same quality for what I want. So we have a big unresolved problem of the entire system. And, and also, then what then happens is that all inequalities are perpetuated. So, but what should happen is that the curriculum transformation to try begin to deal with this issue, is that it, these matters must be put back into the curriculum, into a discussion where lecturers, students and others are not only speaking to those they agree with, because that is not a university. Mm -hmm. University should challenge your comfort zones yes. and you understand where the rich person is coming from, the rich person comes where the poor person is coming from, and you say, we want to create a society without rich, poor, and equal, equal. I'm glad so. you said that, and I just want to go very quickly to you, Pastor, before we go to a break, because we're almost at the end. But I'm going to come back to what Professor Cooper says. I mean, you have picked up on all of these issues when you did the Walk for Access, right? Yes, uh, Walk for Access wasn't just about raising money, but as we walked from Cape Town to Pretoria, we brought various communities together. Various people and various communities, most of the time, we slept in shacks. Uh, most of the time we passed out of uh, plastic basins. But there was times where different racial groups throughout the country opened their hearts to us to join in into this cause. So we see as hashtag Walk for Access a student initiative that brought the country uh, together over various uh, divines. Okay, so we're going to break when we come back. I'd like to start with you again, just to talk about what was perhaps the greatest challenge that you felt in this entire period, but we'll see you after the break. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment, a very exciting interview. I have the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawane Kupe, with me a fallist in the Walk for Access student, Marcus Mashinini, and Pastor Emmanuel. He's Lundman, he's from the Full Gospel, Ilim Full Gospel Church. Of course, it's, it's a challenging discussion. And uh, Pastor, as you said, you know, that it was about bringing people together and you know, concluding on what Professor Coupe said, that there needs to be specific changes where the rich recognizes the right of the poor, the challenges of the poor, and the poor recognizes that, you know, these are different kinds uh, of strata of societies and how to deal with that, not to feel alienated in that. And you felt that in the Walk for Access. Yes, we, we started off, uh, if I can call it, in the colored community of the Western Cape. We went to the black community of the Free State. Um, we stayed with some uh, white people in the Karoo. Uh, so we experienced South Africa on a, on, and all its diversity, various homes, uh, but everybody opening up for us. Uh, in Bloemfontein, we stayed in Botsobelo, uh, in a rural area. The next night, somebody arranged for us a five-star accommodation in the city. And the very next night, we slept in a shack in uh, Batu. So we have experienced all of that. 
But the thing that dawned on me while we were going through all of this is that everybody living in these various conditions, we all still go to the same shops, buying at the same price. The same food, right? Yeah, eating the same food. So if you can afford it. Yeah, if you can afford it. Yeah. And there's where the challenges are, that we need to go and relook at these structures, relook at these systems. Based on that, Professor Cooper, you're speaking about these challenges. I mean, the buzzword at the campus at the University of Pretoria is that they are cautiously optimistic about your presence here. Because, you know, what has happened over the last 25 years Putting a black face does not necessarily mean transformation. Sometimes, very often, it's used as window dressing. And just as one of the students told me last week, they said, how is Coupe going to do anything? He still has to face council, which is largely a full body of white African men who are determined to keep the status quo. What we feel, and I'm being honest, is that you might be hamstrung on many occasions when you really want to bring about transformation. And if things go wrong, it's very easy to say the black man failed. I'm not going to look behind at who put the challenges on you, who stabbed you, or who prevented you, tied your hands. How do you feel about being in this position and recognizing that being in a previously white Afrikaans university is a huge challenge if you come with the mandate of transformation? No, I came from a previously white university. Africans or not Africans doesn't matter. If there is a history, a legacy of whiteness, there are particular challenges. Just let me also say what is interesting about the investor of Pretoria is that the council is no longer largely white men. Interestingly, the one demographic that's image is black women are now a significant and younger black women are now actually almost the same number as, uh, as, as white men. And the white men also are no longer just Africans, it's a little bit diverse. But also, so, so, so what we have now is a diversifying university which faces certain challenges. The one thing I agree with is transformation is not an individual, it's a program. So your demographic does not mean therefore you are transformative. So you could find that actually funny enough, a white vice chancellor could have a transformation program where a black vice chancellor like me was conservative and not transformative. But second, transformation is also not, any vice chancellor who thinks transformation is just about them, telling people or showing people how to transform, will not transform the institution. Transformation is, the transformation program must be owned by everybody. But the vice chancellor has a greater responsibility to ensure that the transformation programs and ideas of the community are actually realized in practice on the ground. I personally believe that it's, and change is very difficult and causes a lot of traumas, if you like, even for those who are working for the program. I personally feel from what I've studied at the University of Pretoria, when I was applying for the job, that I did a thorough diligence in the interview process and having landed on the ground, that we have a unique opportunity to bring a collective, collaborative, transformative program where no one person wants to be a hero of transformation, especially the vice chancellor. It's a, effort. it's a very collective effort because what can a vice chancellor do sitting in one office in the ship at the edge of the university? But a, a vice chancellor is one richness. There are rich ideas out there among the students, the young people that are coming up who will make the new South Africa. And also all of those people with wisdom or have been marginalized like persons like yourselves with good ideas to create a space where everybody feels safe enough to suggest and challenge others to uptake the transformative program. Of course, the program must leave after the vice chancellor is gone. Yes. Vice chancellor has five, five year contract. After that five years, the test for me is, did, my, the, the, le, did I provide leadership to people who will continue with their struggle to transform the institution? But I think the problem is on the ground. Um, there's, there's an idea and a talk of transformation in the university and everyone is talking about transformation, but yet you don't see the fruit on the ground. You don't see it happening with the students. I think the biggest issue is students are still unaccepting of each other because of the, the, the idea and the feel that you get when you, when you come into the university. There's a student um, who came and said, you know, I'm, I'm a first year student, but I feel like I'm in a white university. You know, as, as, a, as a black student, if you still feel like you're in a white university, it becomes a problem because now you cannot sort of um, establish and find yourself within the institution. The, it, it's oppressive towards who you are, you know. So I think the transformation needs to filter down because as much as we may have a black council, if the university students do not feel the transformation and they do not see the transformation, we're still going to have the same issues because the issues start with the students. 
to say the students are having problems with this and this and that. If the students don't see the change happening, or the students don't change themselves, at the end of the day, we're going to have an issue. Pastor, I think part of that was you heard plenty of the students coming into your church complaining there isn't a decent air conditioner in the library. It's cold and it's freezing in winter like now the last few weeks, you know, it's been cold. The university, you go to the relative authorities, we're working on it, we're going to revamp the library. And students say, we don't want you to revamp the library, just give us an air conditioner that works so that when we the students stand we can study. There is the sense of this feeling, then do you find that it's still there? I know Prof Krupe has been there only for a few months, Prof, I know it's very hard to, to, to expect an, a relative change around, but still students feel that they talk but nobody's listening. Yes, um, that, is, that, that is a reality. And uh, I find that students need guidance, continuously assistance to get to the relevant people to make the relevant decisions. Um, uh, I had students come with various issues. A student couldn't get his degree because of uh, payment. Uh, and then I had to go and find out nobody can get a letter from the university that says uh, he is qualified and he's got a degree. So, it's so is the university prepared to give the academic record as well? Uh, yes, there okay. is an academic record that is available uh, and uh, I had to find out those kind of things for students which always didn't always get the, the relevant information. But can we also say the following is that there are varied experiences across yes. the university and changes like that. So if something changes over there, something has still remained the same and something yeah. can actually regress. Because yes. I've been meeting different societies of students who also will speak of a very wonderful experience. And I always say, yes. it's good that you have that wonderful experience. What we want that experience is to spread across. Because also sometimes, uh, it's even the person who's managing something, you go to Campus X, you find all the air conditioning works, and if that, and there's a system of reporting. I was at a race this week, and I found that the house come, there was a lady in charge of making sure that if water is not hot, this is not that. She reports and the house father or the house mother actually saw that. You go to raise eggs, you find that the system is not working. Mm. And it's not that the university wants anybody to be called. <laughs> no, no. So I think so. What we must do then is, I like what you said and also what the yeah. pastor said is, how to ensure that the good experiences are the majority and the key and the normative experiences throughout the university. Where are areas of problems? And how do we collectively resolve them? The one thing I also want my, the students at UP to be, which I was able to do as a student, to be able to have a system that is responsive to them, so that they do things for themselves, so that no one is ever doing things for them. Because it deprives you of the learning experiences you need when you become a fully functional citizen and an adult. Because the university is the learning lab of your life. And this is with hashtag walk for access where we see where it's leading to. Absolutely. Bringing the student body together yeah. as, a, as being, let's call it pioneer work of student initiative, but bringing the rest of the student body together and say, how do we as a student body together come up with student initiatives that bring solutions to student issues? That's why I supported walk for access because it was a, a very, it was like students doing it for themselves. Because for me, I'm not one of those persons who believes that students are children. No, they're actually adults. And I always argue with people who say, the boy is the case, meaning university student. No university student is a boy or a girl. They're a young adult and they're full, uh, they can do things for themselves. And actually adults need, or older people rather, need to learn from the students. There's nobody who's more creative than a student because now they are not encumbered. Because we must solve the financial issues because that prevents students to... But also they, what these guys did, they were in a financial constraining, debilitating environment. They thought of a solution and actioned it and asked the rest of us. So I had to support them, not tell them what to do. And that is what should happen. And that's wonderful. But we're really at the end. Marcus, you've got 30 seconds. How would you like to end this? Well, I think uh, every student needs to stand up at the end of the day and, and take charge of their own life. Um, no one owes us anything in this world at the end of the day. As much as we can expect government to do certain things, government is not there um, to, to solve our life problems. At the end of the day, uh, it's up to us. And we are calling on all staff members, every university um, academic, 
to, to stand up as well with us. And, and just like Professor Kupe has been supporting us, support hashtag Walk for Access, support such initiatives going forward. Thank, Thank you very much to all of you. And I'd like to say, we, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again. But right now we're at the end and it was amazing. Thank you, Professor Kupe, once again for making this time. Fia Manila, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. مديح الهادي تنتظم ضاءت بالمختار ظلم وحلافي ما